All right, welcome everyone. We are the UBC Learning Circle, and we are based out of the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health, which is located on the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Musqueam people. We are generously funded by the First Nations Health Authority, whom we have the pleasure of having here today. Thank you for coming. The Learning Circle is a program that features workshops on, the fir on First Nations physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional health and wellness, and prioritizes First Nations knowledge sharing among health professionals, community members, elders, students, and youth. Hello, my name is Aurelia Kinslow. I am the education coordinator here at the UBC Learning Circle. My heritage is uh, Cherokee Choctaw, African American, and Scandinavian. And um, I'm very happy to be here today uh, uh, welcoming the First Nations Health Authority. We have amongst us uh, Dave Davis McKenzie, who is from Tlamin First Nation. He leads, plans, and executes FNHA's internal and external communications and social marketing strategies. He directs and oversees policies, programs, and procedures in the areas of communications, marketing, marketing communication, media relations, public affairs, brand management, and content management for external website and social media platforms. Davis is currently completing his master's in communication management at McMaster University. John Ma, who's at the end over there, uh, is from Edmonton, Alberta, and serves as the Vice President of First Nations Health Benefits. As VP of Health Benefits, John leads the transfer of the health benefits program at the First Nations Health Authority. Areas of responsibility include pharmacy, dental, mental health, medical transportation, medical supplies and equipment, and medical service plan enrollment. Darren McKnight, who's in blue, is the Director of Benefit Management at the First Nations Health Authority. Darren has been with the FNHA for two years, and he is leading the FNHA's transition of prescription drug coverage to BC Pharmacare. In addition, Darren has responsibility for managing benefit policy for the First Nations Health Benefit Program and the de delivery of, F of FNHA's oral health program. Darren has an MBA from UBC Sauter School of Business. Cindy Preston, who is right here, is a pharmacist working with FNHA Health Benefits and Nursing Services on issues related to pharmacy services, regulatory issues, and practice standards. She is passionately working on FNHA's Healthy Medication Use Initiative, an initiative that promotes safe use of appropriate drug therapies and to support community awareness of importance of safe prescription drug use. Thank you so much for being here today, um, and I'll leave the floor to you. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for hosting, and and thank you to everyone who's uh, joining us. Hello. It's great to be able to see you. Um, so this is our fifth uh, webinar on uh, pharmacare, and uh, we're we're excited to be bringing some new news today, uh, which uh, we we look forward to sharing. Uh, just just a little note about what we've been doing. Um, we've been collecting sort of the the questions and feedback through that we've been receiving through the webinars, through our Facebook channels, and through much of our face to face engagement. Um, and really trying to refine and move forward the presentation each time. So we appreciate that there are folks that have been with us almost all five sessions. So give yourselves a round of applause. We really appreciate your commitment uh, to, to, to learning more about the pharmacare transition and sharing that information with your community members and clients. Uh, so today we're, we're again gonna bring forward some of the most common questions, um, but then really turn it over to you and, and hear the questions that you have that are, that are outstanding. We're, we're about 10 days uh, out of the transfer, so uh, lots of new news to share. And uh, without further ado, I'd, I'd like to turn it over to our VP Health Benefits, uh, John Ma, to introduce the session. John. Thank you, uh, Davis. Um, thanks, everyone, for uh, taking time out of your uh, busy morning to uh, listen to some information that we have around the, this very important um, transition, transformation of uh, our pharmacy benefits uh, to the uh, pharmacare program of the of the ministry. Um, these are really exciting times for us at the First Nations Health Authority as this sort of is another um, first for the First Nations Health Authority in, in the um, in the country and, and it's an important milestone uh, because this really sets the stage for um, even further transformation as we want to take the uh, where we want to take the uh, First Nations Health Benefits uh, program. And so some of the session obje objectives that we want to uh, cover today are, um, you know, what is the uh, the pharmacare uh, uh, transition? Uh, really provide an, an overview of uh, the pharmacare plan W that we've uh, set up for the FNHA uh, clients, um, and then uh, how are we going to reach everyone and engage the uh, the clients throughout 
and then uh, in the end a little bit of a question and, and answer um, uh, for for us. Next slide. So the vision of the eventual transition um, to the BC Pharmacare began over a decade ago when the uh, First Nations Leadership Council and the BC government um, uh, signed, a, uh, signed a plan committing the BC government to expand uh, and extend all services um, uh, enjoyed by all British Columbians to First Nations in, in, in British Columbia. And so when we, um, so to ensure the continuity, um, we, uh, the First Nations Health Authority um, uh, entered into a buyback arrangement when um, the speed at which the decision to create the First Nations Health Authority to when the First Nations Health Authority was created, it was, was very fast and, and the, and the uh, best way for us to continue services from Health Canada to FNHA was to get into a buyback arrangement. And from this buyback arrangement, we really focused um, our energies on uh, improving client services um, and improving the wait times that people were experiencing, um, and, and with uh, with very little um, uh, ability to uh, change the program while we were under the uh, non-insured health benefits um, uh, adjudication system. But since assuming the responsibility in 2013, you know, we, as I mentioned, we mentioned we we worked on service standards and and improving client service, but we, and we stretched our operations really to the the borders of what we really were able to do to to improve the uh, the service under the NIHB policies, and um, but we realized that lots of work um, remained. And, um, and it was just simply wasn't possible to continue to do the transition and transformation that we needed within the, uh, within the NIHB uh, program. And so we needed to find um, another, um, another way, another claims adjudicator to help us with this, uh, with, the, with the additional work that we needed to do. And so in the four years since the transfer, uh, we've heard from First Nations leaders, we've heard from health directors, caregivers, and the citizens about the need to, to continue to transform the health benefits and uh, meet uh, further meet uh, the wellness uh, the wellness needs. So some of these uh, the vision the values the directives these are all familiar to to, um, to many of you um, and we've um, and this transformation was really based on the teachings that we received from our leaders um, and we use them as a foundation of this project moving uh, moving forward. More specifically, it was really focused around directive uh, number three in terms of us uh, really looking to improve services, and that's really improving the services of the First Nations Health Benefits uh, Program. Um, some of the other things are the uh, some key principles were that we looked for a, a seamless transition for the clients from when from moving from. NIHB over to the uh, Pharmacare system. We wanted to really make sure that whatever system that we created was uh, in going to improve access for, um, for BC First Nations. And also we heard from uh, our engagement with communities and through the Health Directors Association that the, the, uh, to really needed to resolve the payer of last resort issue, which was a, a real problem for individuals as they were at the pharmacy uh, counter. And so those were the main principles that we wanted to ensure when we were looking for um, uh, a new adjudicator. And so through, uh, as I mentioned, this is the first of its kind partnership with the BC Ministry of Health and we created a, a new First Nations Pharmacare plan called Plan W and the W stands for um, wellness. Um, so what will the, the, the change bring? Well the pharmacy benefit has been prioritized and uh, because it is the one benefit that uh, affects the um, and impacts the most uh, the most people. We haven't taken our eye off the other benefits, but pharmacy is really the first uh, trans uh, transition that we've um, started with. So on October first, the Drug Benefit Administration um, is transferring from Health Canada over to uh, the Pharmacare program, and it's a partnership that we have with the min through the min uh, partnership through the Ministry of of Health. Um, this is made possible by um, a regulatory change that occurred back in uh, March 2017, which uh, originally the regulation excluded uh, BC First Nations from accessing provincial programs. And, um, and so with this regulatory change that we worked on with the ministry, now this allows us to uh, start using the, um, the, the program moving, moving forward. And so by joining Pharmacare, uh, BC First Nations will be part of the uh, Provincial Drug Insurance Program 
and it will and and BC First Nations will um, have the same access as other BC uh, First Nations, uh, which is a, um, a a real big step for for us. Um, and and as I mentioned earlier, pharmacy is really the first step in what we want to do. It's really part of a longer journey. It's um, you know, and where we take far um, on October first. Even the pharmacy benefit in terms of the transition transformation that we have planned for it is really just a first step on October 1st and we will have the opportunity to evolve and change the, uh, the program as we move, uh, move forward. But in terms of a bigger picture, um, we still have our eyes on the vision, uh, dental and medical supplies and equipment um, through a phase two that we have planned over the next 12 months. Um, which we will uh, also uh, transition away from the uh, Health Canada program and, and build um, and, and work our, our something that is unique to, to us in, in BC. And so um, that's just really a quick introduction to the, the transition, uh, transformation, and I'll turn it over to uh, Darren, who will um, now specifically talk about uh, Plan W. Thank you very much, John. Um, this is this is work uh, that that we've been doing for for quite some time, as as I think many people know. And so, uh, for me, it's it's very exciting to be able to come out and actually share what we're doing, and, and to have it so close, uh, less than less than two weeks away. Uh, it's certainly a, a very exciting time around our office, and we're we're really looking forward to talking about uh, what what's coming today. Uh, in terms of, of the, the rest of the, the presentation, uh, what I'm going to do is, is go through at, at a high level what some of the changes are, uh, some of the challenges and benefits that we see, and, and some of the key messages that, that uh, we want to make sure we get out. Uh, Davis will speak briefly about communications, and then the meat of the presentation really is, is Cindy, who's our, our pharmacy expert, and, and she'll go through kind of an FAQ that, that is uh, in, in some detail about, about what's coming. Uh, so Plan W, uh, what is it? Uh, it Plan W will provide uh, coverage for el eligible prescription drugs and many over-the-counter products. Uh, it's a payer of first resort. Uh, it is a fully paid plan. Uh, there's no income testing, uh, no deductible, and much of this transition work is happening in, in the background. There's no new forms to fill out as, as we transition enrollment <coughs> from the NIHB program into PharmaCare Plan W. Um, as we know, a number of you have actually been uh, with us on, on previous webinars and, and uh, if you're paying very close attention, you'll notice there's a, a bit of a change on, on this slide that I, I do want to highlight some new information. Um, in the first bullet, uh, this plan covers not just eligible prescription drugs, uh, but many over-the-counter products. And that, that's some new information uh, that we have um, come to agreement with, uh, with the Ministry of Health and PharmaCare uh, just over the last several days. Uh, which uh, the result of that is, is a switch of, of more of our med medications and products from, uh, from the NIHB program to PharmaCare, which we hope is a, a real benefit to our, not just our clients, but also to the, the prescribers and to the pharmacists out there, just to make it a little bit easier as we, as we go forward. Um, one, one thing that comes up often uh, is how our plan, Plan W, relates to the other plans that, that might exist uh, or that do exist under the PharmaCare umbrella. And uh, a lot of questions come up around a, a program called Fair PharmaCare. And, and I, I just want to comment on that here because it's, it, it, we're having a lot of people ask, do I need to fill out a new form? Do I need to go through income testing as, as we move to October 1st? And, and the short answer, as you see on the slide there, is no. This is a fully paid plan, not income tested. Uh, there's no requirement to go through the, the sign-up pro process for, for Fair PharmaCare. This is, this is a unique, unique plan under the PharmaCare umbrella. And speaking of umbrellas, <laughs> this, uh, this slide is really intended to articulate uh, what's changing as we move towards our October 1st. Our current state uh, has the uh, entire NIHB, or sorry, the entire umbrella really being covered by the the FNHA NIHB formulary. So the, the all of our claims and all of our, our coverages happen through NIHB at, at present. But as we move to October 1st, uh, really Plan W becomes part of a, a suite of plans and services that become available uh, to our clients. Plan W will become uh, the primary source of, of coverage for people, but there are alternate uh, uh, areas or ways, mechanisms that, that people can obtain other 
uh, benefits and services and, and Cindy will get more uh, into this as she gets into the detail of her presentation so we'll show this slide again uh, but very briefly there are other aspects of coverage around uh, for example provincial agencies the other pharmacare plans uh, special authority processes and there is a slice that remains uh, uh, in terms of work that will remain with NIHB uh, on a temporary basis as we move past uh, past October 1st I'll talk about challenges and benefits and and as we as we get into this I, I think for us it's re very important that we put the the challenges first within the conversation uh, we want to make sure that that we're in a position to have uh, an open transparent dialogue with our with our clients uh, with uh, prescribers as well as with with pharmacists so we always like to put the, the challenges first within the in the discussion uh, a few sort of big ones that that we want to go through uh, first is that there's no template for this work. Uh, this is, uh, as John mentioned, it's sort of a first of its kind move from the NIHB into a provincial program. It's work like this hasn't been tackled before. And, and so uh, on the one hand, it's, it's exciting because we're, we're breaking ground as we work through our, our project, uh, but it, it does bring challenges as, as we move forward. And part of that means that we rely on, on very strong partnerships with our external stakeholders, uh, Pharmacare as our new partner, and NIHB as our existing and, and ongoing partner as, as we move into Pharmacare uh, Plan W. From a communication side, this is also our first attempt to reach out to our entire FNHA client base. Um, it's important to know that a large percentage of our population, well over 90%, won't be impacted directly by this change, but a small number of people will be impacted. And to that end, we're really doing our best to get our word out to everyone, uh, whether we have people in urban areas, uh, people in rural areas, where we are doing our best to, to reach out uh, to clients uh, really across the entire province of, of BC. With that comes some special challenges that Davis will, will talk about in terms of our communication planning. Uh, the bottom three bullets are uh, a bit more fine detail that uh, both Cindy and I will, will talk through as, as we uh, go through the, this discussion uh, very briefly uh, regarding out of province. Um, a key takeaway for people today is is if you're traveling outside of BC, uh, plan ahead. Uh, talk to your doctor and pharmacist before you leave the province uh, and get the medications that you need uh, before traveling. And I'll explain why in, in a few moments. Um, as well, uh, some clients will be asked to transition to comparable drugs on the Pharmacare formulary, and, and Cindy's going to get into uh, quite a number of examples, I, I, I think, just to, to highlight the, the areas that, that people need to watch out. And uh, the last one is the change that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, most of our coverage will move to Pharmacare Plan W. However, some products, some prescription drugs, some over-the-counter products, uh, will be covered by NIHB on a transitional basis. So some products will remain uh, under the current system uh, until uh, such time as we have uh, our third party provider in place. And I believe John mentioned that towards the top as we look to another partner to help us with some of the other benefit areas and some small pieces of our, our pharmacy benefit. Regarding benefits, uh, I'd I like to look at this both from the client perspective uh, in terms of, of service, what will the client experience with, with this change, and also system. And, and so from the client perspective, the, these first three bullets I, I think are, are very, very important because they all, for me, roll up into uh, improving ease of access uh, to benefits and services uh, for, for our clients. So uh, some examples uh, under the first one, alignment with provincial practices and standards. At, at present, uh, our clients often uh, get caught in, in gaps that exist within in the system, uh, particularly as they move between uh, federal and provincial jurisdictions. And one place that happens is when people move out of the primary care system in the province and, and uh, return to community, uh, people can get, get caught in access gaps uh, that happen between that provincial and federal jurisdiction. And, so our alignment with the provincial programs, uh, standards and practices really helps close those gaps for our clients and, and we think will we'll improve ease of access uh, to the medications that people need. Um, additionally, um, PharmaCare <coughs> is the largest uh, and most well-known uh, program in, in the province. 
Uh, we know uh, that in general, uh, prescribers, uh, these would be nurse practitioners and doctors, um, as well as pharmacists, are more familiar with the PharmaCare program. And what that means is it, it, we expect that in the client interaction, uh, when our clients show up at the doctor's office or at the pharmacy counter, uh, they'll be interacting with a professional who uh, has a better understanding of the program uh, that is available for our clients. And again, we expect that that uh, should help uh, improve ease of access and understanding uh, as our clients navigate through the system. Uh, as well, uh, this change brings with it uh, eligibility for access for our clients to additional programs and services. Uh, there are a couple examples listed here. Palliative care is, a, is another program available under the PharmaCare umbrella. And there are other provincial services such as training for blood glucose monitoring uh, amongst a, a number that, that have become now available to our, our FNHA clients. So I think there's a few that roll up into um, direct improvements, service improvements to the client. And I, I think the last one I always want to speak to as a really important system change. And, and it's really, for me, it boils down to one of the primary reasons why, why we're making this move. We're, we're coming from a, a place where um, at FNHA, uh, we work with NIHB on delivery of the drug benefit, but we don't have a lot of influence uh, over what is covered or what is not covered. It's, it's communicated to us, and then we do our best to communicate that, that out. Uh, as we go forward, we enter into a, a partnership with the Ministry of Health, and w what we gain then is the ability to have a conversation with, with PharmaCare and, and talk about uh, the First Nations perspective. And, and really work to include that in delivery of what, what we cover and, and what we don't cover under Plan W. So we're, we're coming from this space where we don't have the ability to provide a lot of influence over our, our drug plan uh, to one where we have uh, an open conversation with, with our partner and, and the ability to influence what we, what we do as we move forward. So I, I see that as really a primary benefit of, of the, the work that, that we're doing here. Just before I pass it over to Davis, uh, just I want to summarize some key messages. If, if you remember anything that I say today, I hope it, it's these, these few things. Uh, one, the transition is coming quickly. We're less than two weeks away. Uh, the first claims will be processed through PharmaCare on uh, Sunday, October 1st, and we have all our eyes on, on that date as, as we move forward. Uh, the majority of our clients won't experience a change. Uh, over 90% uh, should not see any, any significant change, uh, but we are doing our best to get the word out to make sure that people uh, know what's happening. Uh, the transition is happening in the background, uh, so uh, that would be records of enrollment, but also uh, some what we call drug grandparenting, which Cindy will, will talk about, that will allow some continuity of therapy for people. Uh, that's all happening um, in the background electronically and, and people shouldn't need to uh, act in order to uh, ensure they're covered under, under Plan W. In order to obtain your benefits, once you arrive at the pharmacy counter, we're advising everyone to uh, attend with not just their status card as they might now, uh, but also their, their PHN or personal health number, which can be found on, on the BC Services card. Uh, that may be your, your driver's license or, or other piece of provincial, uh, provincial um, identification. That you, if you arrive with those two uh, pieces of ID, you should have what you need to access uh, both Plan W and, and other coverages. Uh, plan ahead before you travel. Uh, get what you need before leaving BC. Uh, we have some processes that will be available to people who uh, are traveling outside the province, but largely it's very important that you, uh, if you know you're leaving BC, get what you need before you travel and um, ensure that, that you're covered for the, the duration of your trip. And then lastly, uh, we always want to say we're here to help. We, you know, we expect there will be uh, some bumps in the road for a small number of people. Um, we want to be here to help you through that transition. Uh, our phone number, 1-855-550-5454, is our health benefits uh, support line. Uh, we have added resources to, to that line. We have additional staff available. Uh, we're expanding the hours of all, our call center. Um, we, we want to be here to help. So if you have any challenges, please please pick up the phone and give us a call. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it to Davis. <coughs>
Great, thank you, Darren. Uh, so, so as I was introduced, uh, thank you so much to UBC Learning Circle for hosting us. My name is Davis McKenzie. I'm the Director of Communications. I'll, I'll spend uh, just a few minutes with you walking through some of the elements of our communication plan. I'm from Tlalman Nation and my um, ancestral name is Ajay Mathoa. And I, I guess one key message I want to bring to this work is that uh, I'm also a beneficiary of this plan. So this work is, is very important. and. And I'm mindful of the way that I'm reaching not only my own family and my own nation in this work, but also the broader First Nations community because uh, we know how hard it can be to reach everybody. And I think that our, we take this work very seriously. It's very important uh, that we do reach our clients. And it's not an easy task. We have 143,000 clients located all across the province. Um, we have over 200 First Nations and 34 languages, many different cultural approaches, many different approaches to how we share information amongst one another and with our people who live away from home. So, so it's, it's quite a, and it, it, it's, I think it's a great opportunity and it's a beautiful environment that we're working in. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how we've uh, sought to reach out to people. Um, and, and I think I'd like to lead off by saying a lot of the elements of our strategy actually came from the First Nations Health Directors Association. So when we first came to this issue, we went to the health directors and said, how are we going to solve this, this issue? How are we going to reach everybody? We really need to reach everybody. And they gave us some really great advice. And one of the things that health directors told us is that um, give us a communications program in a box. Uh, give us the posters, give us, give us the key messages, tell us what this change is all about and give it to us in a way that we can help pass it along to our clients to ensure that they have a smooth and seamless transition. So one of the first things that we did was develop that, that communications kit in a box and ship it out to over 500 locations across the province. So these included our First Nations Health Centers, uh, but also our Aboriginal Friendship Centers, uh, many urban uh, agencies, and then the top 50 pharmacies who we do a lot of business with. Um, we also sought to get those marketing kits uh, into those locations. So um, those, those kits uh, also went to some of our partners. So we know the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, the First Nations Summit, uh, the INAC uh, office here in BC, um, the uh, BC Assembly of First Nations, these are all high traffic areas where, where our people are. So, so we, we also sought to, to meet that need. Uh, we've got uh, a web site, sort of a couple of web pages that are dedicated to the change, as do our partners over at Pharmacare. And um, I just checked in on the stats yesterday and in the first quarter, uh, we've had over 12,500 unique visitors to those pages. And, and people spend an average of three to five minutes there. So it's not a quick, pop in and then look at their, people are looking at our FAQs and I think really trying to make sense of this change. Um, we've established a, a separate stream of communications for providers. So we know that pharmacists, physicians, they're going to have different questions than community members. So really look to uh, establish two streams of communication there. Um, one of the principles in, in, in communications and reaching people, I think, is often around, uh, it's the saying of pour the concrete where the people walk. And, and for me, that means uh, a really big social media campaign because uh, the research that we've done, uh, our people spend a, a fair bit of time on Facebook uh, and that's a really popular channel. So if you haven't seen our Facebook ads, we wanna know. Um, we've we've active, actively been pushing out 45 days of unique content on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, all of the channels, but um, really going where people are uh, is, has been part of the strategy. Uh, we've created a very simple uh, video to explain the change, the, the sort of top three elements around the change. And um, as of today, I think we've got over 88,000 views on that video. Um, but that's a little bit tricky because people often will scroll by a video. So I think what's more important is the engagement levels. And 33,000 people have actually engaged with the content of that video. That means watching the video through. Uh, that means sharing it, commenting it, liking it. So, so that level of engagement is more important to us than what a superficial sort of, I scrolled by it in my feed, you know, I didn't really pay attention. Um, because we were trying to reach people for the first time, uh, we thought it would be important to send a direct letter uh, to each of our clients. So. Um, Back, uh, back in, I, I think our first client letter went out in uh, the first week of July, and it went to 91,000 uh, First Nations people over the age of 18 uh, living in British Columbia. So um, we, we did have some bounce backs, and we've talked about those in our prior uh, webinars. It's important to know that the second client letter uh, is being mailed out this week uh, and will be received before October 1st. This includes some updated information that we think is important uh, and will be talked about by Cindy in, in some of the future slides. 
Um, but, but just so you know, uh, especially for health directors that are on the line, a second client letter is coming uh, to describe those uh, further changes. Um, so I just want to talk just briefly about uh, working with our healthcare provider partners. So uh, as many of you know, um, this past March, all of the health regulated health professionals in BC signed a declaration of cultural safety and humility. And this is a first for Canada. So physicians, pharmacists, nurse practitioners, every regulated health profession professional is covered by this declaration. So to me, what this is, is it's a commitment to work better with, with us as First Nations people and First Nations agencies. So I'm really excited about that change and, and the relationships that have been built as a result of that declaration, um, because it's, it's about specific care and understanding for our populations. Um, we've been working quite well, I would say, with the, uh, the regulatory bodies. They've sort of jumped at the opportunity to partner with us, so especially the College of uh, Pharmacists, uh, physicians, they gave us access to their mailing list so we could mail a letter to the 12,600 practicing uh, physicians in BC right now. So, so I think those partnerships have been really important to, uh, to, reaching, uh, to reaching our people. Um, I would say uh, one thing is that the First Nations Health Authority being a four-year-old organization is not known to everyone. So that relationship between the doctor and the, and the patient, the doctor and the client, is so important because those relationships have probably been going 20 years sometimes and, and with elders sometimes 40 years, right? So just really important that we reach the physician so they can talk to uh, our clients as well. Um, I, I would just maybe uh, next slide, we'll, I'll try to hurry up. Sorry, I'd love to talk about this stuff. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I would just say that uh, this, this cool looking but maybe blurry on your screen graphic uh, is our communications algorithm. So this really uh, reflects uh, sort of the, the pacing of the communication. And uh, as you see, the, we've got a sunny October launch day uh, coming up, uh, but our communications don't stop October 1st. Uh, they continue and, and they persist because we know that not everything's gonna happen October 1st, right? So as people you know, go to fill per their prescriptions in October, later October, November, that's when some of the challenges may arise. Our, our phone lines are beefed up to, uh, to deal with those challenges. Um, as well as our communication uh, goes on uh, over that period of time. Um, one quick note, we did a bit of research around, um, if you all remember when Obamacare was put in in the United States, uh, they, they did a lot of research around how to reach people and engage people on a, on a health benefit type change. And one thing they learned was people don't pay attention till about three weeks out of a change, no matter how early you message. Um, and I think that this is because we all have lives. Um, so, you know, we all have jobs, kids, responsibilities, and, you know, it usually will just come to the attention sort of quite close to when the change happens. So our communications algorithm, as you see, we started off in June, you know, August with announcements, but we really started to beef up our activities September 1, because that's, that's a month out of the change, and that's actually when people are really starting to pay attention. Um, so, uh, I guess uh, just to, to summarize, uh, these are some of the activities we've undertaken. Uh, I would say the webinars have been some of the most successful engagements we've had because it's two-way and we get a lot of good uh, questions and answers that help us to refine our, our process and get the message out in better ways. So, I'd uh, just like to say that we're uh, open and committed to hearing feedback about our communication approach. Um, and it's helped us uh, so far to hear that client feedback, so we would, we would uh, love to hear more moving forward. But with that, I think I'll turn it over to Cindy to get into the real meat of the presentation. Um, so thank you for, uh, for hearing, hearing us out. So hi everyone, I'm Cindy Preston. I'm the pharmacist with First Nations Health Authority. Um, so what we have here on the slide is the umbrella that Darren showed earlier. And this is what our drug benefits that um, First Nation Health Authority clients access looks like after October 1st. So today, um, as John mentioned, we're in that buyback situation with, with Health Canada. So the Non-Assured Health Benefits Program is providing the drug benefits for us. And it is the federal system. And that system um, is defined federally. So after October 1st, when we move to this new umbrella plan that we have, um, and we have the Plan W within Pharmacare, we also have some stronger linkages within the BC healthcare system. So in this, um, in this new after October 1st plan, um, there's several components to it. So Plan W, that's the core plan within Pharmacare. So that has most of the or prescription drugs, as well as many, many OTCs. So most drugs that we'll be accessing for, 
for coverage exist in this plan. Um, <clears throat> you'll see the special authority just to the to the right or sorry to the left. <laughs> the special authority coverage. These these are list of items or list of drugs that do require some criteria to be met for coverage to be put into place. So the prescribers, the doctors, the MPs or specialists will apply for special authority and that activates coverage and then it's paid. Um, we, then we have the other pharmacare plans. We will go to the, to the right on this one. Um, other pharmacare plans. So Plan W is the main plan, but there's some supplementary plans that also exist. So as we move into, as a pharmacare beneficiary, our FNHA clients can be enrolled in Plan W, but they can be enrolled in any other pharmacare plan that they're eligible for. And prescribers know to enroll people in the, in the, in the plans that they would be eligible for. So for example, cystic fibrosis. Um, for individuals with cystic fibrosis, um, they can be enrolled into the cystic fibrosis plan, which opens up extra drug coverage specific to that condition. Um, palliative care is another one. Palliative care, um, when a client is palliative, a physician or MP can enroll them into the plan P, the Pharmacare plan, and that activates extra drug coverages for some other drugs that may not be covered on plan W or the other core plans within Pharmacare. It also activates coverage within the health authorities. So it activates services and it activates some medical supply um, coverages within the health authorities. So that's another venue that we're going to follow up on, on phase two after October to really make sure that, that those linkages are strong. We are no longer excluded from those services after October 1st. Um, there is the provincial agencies, which you'll see even more far to the right. Um, the provincial agencies are the agencies that provide specialized services and, and drug coverages for HIV, AIDS, um, for transplant, um, for kidney disease, which would be the renal agency, and the cancer agency. So these agencies, BC First Nations, have always been able to be registered in these programs and access these programs, but because of the jurisdictional benefit program that we had, some clients have not registered and have, are not accessing through those agencies. So this is our opportunity to um, really get into those agencies and use the, the services and the drug, um, the drug formularies that exist there. So you will see way over on the left, there's that small little section. And as Darren mentioned, this section got even smaller in the last few days. Mm -hmm. This section was to, um, to, to ensure we have access to the drugs that we need um, for our clients after October 1st. So originally this one, the NHB formulary, the drugs that are continue to be paid through the NHB system, um, it did include a lot of over-the-counter items. So now um, I'm happy to say that a, a lot of those items have moved over into the Pharmacare plan or are part of the core plan, the core benefits that are provided through the BC Pharmacare program. Um, there are a few items left in this category and some of them are um, very select few prescription drug items. So um, allergy eye drops um, is one example, as well as some of the contraceptives that are not eligible within the Pharmacare program. Those exist on that formulary to make sure that there's ongoing access to those drugs. Um, so I guess you'll see the handle too, that's the FNHA health benefits. So I like to make a pun here where it is the health benefits handle. So operations, the, the, the phone number that Darren mentioned earlier, um, and the operation team that's on the call center, they handle any issues with coverages in there. They are the, the people to contact should there be any issue arising from this transition or even after the transition. Um, they, would, they troubleshoot and get the answers to people as they need them. So I'm gonna go through some frequently asked questions and we, We've done several sessions with pharmacists, um, bringing pharmacists together and talking with them and making sure that their questions are being answered and that they have the information they need to make sure that our clients have as smooth a transition into the Pharmacare plan as possible. And it's been very well received and pharmacists are actually quite excited because they actually get to use some of the some of our professional activities that we like to do, like um, adapting prescriptions, changing from one format to another or so forth. So really it is when there is that, <clears throat> when someone goes to the pharmacy and a drug is not covered, pharmacists know what drug can be put in its place. They're very familiar with Pharmacare coverages 
and they have the tools to find out what those other alternatives are. So through their different professional practices of adapting prescriptions or you know contacting the physician and having a conversation about what other op options are, um, that all becomes part of this conversation for pharmacists. So it's an exciting time. So frequently asked questions that we're hearing from the pharmacists, but also from our community members, go around pretty much in four different areas. So access to the provincial drug benefits, like how do we access it? This also includes the out of province conversation, the provincial agencies as well. Um, <clears throat> and also the, the drug formulary differences and the impact that's gonna have. There's questions around transitional special authorities and grandparenting of coverage. So this will be questions that really relate to, we know there's those, those group of drugs that do require special authority, which used to be called prior approval in NHB. And how are we gonna maintain therapies that we've had ongoing already? Do we actually have to change moving forward after October 1st? So the last one um, is really around preparing for that smooth transition. What can we do to make sure that we're doing everything we can to make it a smooth transition and address any issues that may have been result from a unique approval with an IHB or um, switching to another pharmacare plan or activating that other pharmacare plan to make sure there is coverage and if there is coverage around compounds and I'll get into that a little bit more in just a second. So I'm going to turn it over to Darren and he's going to explain um, the first section of that. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about two of the access questions. I, I, it's not lost on me that Cindy is the star of the show with, <laughs> with the details that she provides around the formulary changes. So I'll try and go through uh, two, two questions quickly just so that we can make sure we have lots of time for Cindy and, and also for questions at the end. So first off, how do I get coverage through, through Pharmacare? Um, I mentioned earlier uh, that most of this transition is, is happening in the background. So uh, for the majority of people, uh, by far majority, um, no action is required. Your, your transition to coverage under Plan W is automatic and will be in effect uh, at 12.01 on, on October 1st. Uh, there are a small number of people, um, certainly uh, people who have their, uh, their MSP administered by their employer may fit into this group. Um, but there are a small number of people that, that will not be transitioned at October 1st. Uh, they will be eligible for benefits under Plan W, but they'll need to contact us in order to go through the enrollment process. Uh, it is important to know that, that for these people, uh, temporary coverage through NIHB uh, will remain in effect uh, to ensure that there are no uh, short-term access uh, gaps for, for those clients. And then out of province, this is a topic as well that I've mentioned a couple times in, in terms of that key piece, key message being plan ahead. Uh, we're moving from a federal program, uh, one that's available nationally, to a provincial program. And, and with that, we introduce uh, a new challenge. And, and specifically, that challenge is that uh, aside from a small number of what we call border pharmacies, uh, BC Pharmacare is not able uh, to directly pay uh, for medications that are purchased outside of BC. So our, our core message, as I said earlier, please plan ahead. Talk to your doctor and pharmacist before leaving uh, BC. Uh, that said, uh, a client reimbursement process is, is going to be in place. Uh, information on that is being prepared to be put on our website now and, and expect to be up before uh, October 1st. If you need to purchase medications while you're outside the province, uh, keep your, your pharmacy receipt. Uh, there'll be a, a link to, the, uh, to a claim form uh, that's available and information on how to submit that, it, that is on our, our website. Uh, if you experience any changes beyond that, again, I, I reiterate, give us a call and we'll try and figure out how to, how to work through uh, issues uh, with you. So uh, plan ahead, um, be aware that there is a reimbursement process if necessary. Uh, and beyond that, uh, please don't hesitate to, to pick up the phone and, and call us. So the third part of the, the frequently asked question about accessing the Pharmacare program. So we heard, how do you, how are we going to access Pharmacare? Well, that's taken care of in the background with enrolling into the Plan P and the out of province um, information that Darren just mentioned. The third part of that is how are, how do we work with these agencies? So I kind of preempted myself, and I did explain <laughs> just recently, just a second ago. But the prescribers do need to register clients into these agencies, and that usually does happen. Um, but there, we know that there are a few clients that have not yet been enrolled. So we're asking prescribers to do that. We're asking pharmacies to, identi to help identify these clients too and have them um, 
talk to prescribers and have them enrolled. Um, and the reason why we're doing this is the drug coverage in Pharmacare, in the Pharmacare plans, is not duplicated um, when in, the coverage in Pharmacare is not duplicated for these conditions. Um, so we do want to make sure people continue to, or continue to have access to those medications. We are transitioning clients out of the system we had before into a new system October 1st. So we've really been working with the, our federal partners to make sure that that transition can go in a smooth, in a smooth manner. So we will be transitioning people over the next few months into the agency processes. Um, I'll just give kind of an example of what this looks like. Okay, so Dan, for this, in this example, Dan lives in Parksville on Vancouver Island. He's got chronic kidney disease, and his doctor has registered him with a real agency. Dan's been getting all his medications from the local pharmacy in town. Actually, I think it actually was bought out and is now a shop for starting rent. <laughs> but um, after October 1st, Dan has to get his, Dan will be getting his kidney disease medications from Central Drugs in Nanaimo. Okay, that pharmacy is that contracted pharmacy by the Reedley Agency. The pharmacists there have specialized knowledge and can provide the specialized pharmacy services. So the drugs to treat kidney disease are being dispensed through that pharmacy. He will continue to visit his local pharmacy for his other medications, and they will dispense and bill FNHA for those medications. The medications for his renal disease um, will have to come from central drugs. It can look, it looks differently through a lot of the different agencies. For example, different agencies will set up processes to make sure the drug gets to the client. Some, sometimes it looks like, um, well, we do know for cancer, sometimes there's mail delivery. But again, in these cases, it is important that we, um, FNHA is going to be working with clients and communities and the pharmacists and physicians to make sure that that medication is, um, can get to the patient. So again, if there are any issues, especially around any agency medications, please call our operations um, at Health Benefits. So another, one of the other big frequently asked questions are, are there differences in the formularies? Yes, there is definitely differences within the drug lists. That said, there's alternatives for drugs um, that exist in the plan. So, like I said, this is where pharmacists get excited because there, uh, there is the ability to adapt to prescription and make sure that person, although they may have a prescription for a drug that's listed on the NHB formulary, they will be able to walk away with a drug that is covered in Pharmacare. Um, they won't be left without an option. So FNHA has been working to ensure we have that transition happening. So when for this transition, there's a several things that are happening. So we are going to have the Plan W working. We're going to have the special authorities there and in place and working. We're going to put some transitional special authorities in place, and they'll be working. And the BC agencies, they're ready, and they are ready to start working <laughs> um, for those that they're already um, not already working for. And then, of course, we have those residual items not covered in Pharmacare that NHB is working to have covered. So it's, it's going to be, um, uh, on October 1st, there shouldn't be um, issues with continuing coverage for medications that exist. So we're going to talk about grandparenting coverage and that's those transitional special authorities. So this really is how we're going to maintain people on the current therapies. So like, I, like we've mentioned before, about 90% of people shouldn't notice a difference after October 1st. The drugs that they have been on will continue to be on. Um, so with this, special authorities are going to be in place after October 1st. There's been a lot of questions around this. NHB has a prior approval process. Do I need to go through that process again? Um, and so forth. So really when we're looking at this, we're only worried about special authorities on drugs in Pharmacare. What happened in NHB and approvals there isn't of our concern anymore. Mm -hmm. um, we're really looking to see what the drug in Pharmacare looks like. What is it? What needs to be in place to maintain coverage there? So the special authority processes are the BC Pharmacare processes. We don't have to worry about people navigating the different systems that NHB had for those. So starting October 1st, it's special authority processes within Pharmacare. So any of the drugs that require special authority, we're working to have all those special authorities put into place and they'll be there and they'll allow coverage and a prescription will be paid October 1st, 2nd, 3rd and ongoing. We're doing exceptional special authorities for drugs that normally wouldn't be in Pharmacare. So if you've always been on a drug therapy, um, 
most of the time, in a very few cases, that drug won't be covered for you later on. So there's no need to change anything. The drug that you're on, the drug therapy you're on today, will be available um, after October 1st. So within the special authority group of drugs and these special transitional authorities, there are going to be some expiry dates. Most are indefinite. So in Pharmacare, when you get a special authority, you get it once and you're done for life. Um, in NHB, it's usually a renewal with every prescription or at certain times, at certain time limits that you have to have, um, physician has to provide more clinical information. So this is a big difference um, with the indefinite special authorities. There are some drugs that do require monitoring. So they're usually renewed every year um, in case the disease has progressed or and just really for the, an opportunity to really check in to make sure that drug is appropriate for you at that time. <coughs> So these drugs <clears throat> that usually require the annual renewal, we're putting a transitional special authority in place for up to six months. That way, October 1st, coverage will be in place, and the doctor can then take over that special authority, apply for special authority ongoing, and it'll just be the regular pro pharmacare processes after that. There is a few drugs that are really high risk, and these ones are kind of low molecular weight heparins, so really they prevent blood clots, and usually people are prescribed them after surgery. That we are granting a 35-day um, special authority on that, and this really is just because they're not usually intended for long-term treatment, and we want the physicians, if it is needed longer, then the physicians can take over that special authority, and it'll get into pharmacare, and it'll be continued on ongoing. So one of the big questions that come out of that, um, do I need to change my drugs? So as we said, 90% of people shouldn't notice a difference on October 1st. But there are a very few cases where it will require physicians or MPs to reassess therapy and in cases where that drug is no longer available. There is a, there's a few cases where you will need to consider an alternative drug in the same class. Those are really, this drug is not covered, but its brother, who works the same way in the body, has the same effects in the body, same side effects in the body, um, those drugs are covered. And for the most part, pharmacists are, you know, will definitely be able to provide um, confirmation that these drugs pretty much, it, drugs within the same class work the same way. Um, change in strength, that's one that we will see a few, um, and as well with change in manufacture. Um, so reassessing the therapy, we have an example here. There's not a lot, it was hard to find some, um, but replenicinide, glucanorm for diabetes. This is one where if a client is not, does not have cystic fibrosis, then we're going to ask that there is a reassessment of therapy. This is a drug that when it came out on the market, it wasn't restricted, and a lot of people were put on it. But there's, there's definitely conversation around risk versus benefit of this drug. So in many cases, it's not a best choice drug. So it's only restricted for the clients that really um, can benefit from it. So this is one that if clients are on it, and we know there are some, if these individuals do not have cystic fibrosis, we would be asking for physicians or prescribers to um, reassess therapy. And on this one too, some of the drugs that we have there, there's very few clients on these drugs. And when I'm working with a pharmacist in NHB and Pharmacare, we're all going, wow, why are people still on these drugs? Mm -hmm. So some of these drugs, um, I guess, during this transition, it's a very good opportunity for patients, for pharmacists and for doctors, to have a conversation about drug therapy and review it. Um, quite often there are newer, better alternatives out there um, that likely should be in place. But it's a great opportunity to have those, have those medication reviews done. Um, considering a drug in, uh, an alternative drug in the same class. So this is quite often where someone will get stuck on a drug um, and newer drugs will come onto the market but that person is just on an older version. So again, people can choose another drug in the class um, and um, continue on their therapy. Um, other drugs in the same class here, um, the next two, um, two eye drops, okay? So one is an antibiotic eye drop and one is an anti-inflammatory eye drop. There's drugs in the other classes for both of these. These drugs um, are quite often prescribed for individuals who have cataract surgery along with a steroid. These drugs, uh, this antibiotic eye drop and this anti-inflammatory eye drop, aren't covered. But there are other antibiotic drops that are very similar in the same in, in the same class that are covered. Same with the anti-inflammatory eye drops. There's another um, 
there's a brother drug <laughs> that is covered in this class. The last one here, um, you've heard us talk about quite a bit before, Genuvia and Janumet. So this is a drug that's commonly used for diabetes. And Jan Genuvia and Janumet were pretty much one of the first drugs on the market in this class. So for us, we see a lot of clients on these drugs. Pharmacare has listed two, two of the three drugs in this class. They chose not to list Genuvia. So what we're gonna be doing is looking for our clients who are currently taking Genuvia to be, to be switched to another drug in the same class that works the same way, that has the same, same effectiveness and the same side effects, <laughs> and to use those other drugs in the class. Um, we know that this is going to be, um, we know we have a lot of clients on this drug, so this is probably the most dramatic example of a drug during the transition. And knowing that, um, we've been working with Pharmacare and they've allowed us to ease the transition on this drug. So for the next three months, we're going to be transitioning everyone off this drug in, onto the other alternatives in class. So that'll be um, physicians and nurse practitioners working with the patients to assess their drug therapy, make sure they should stay on this type of drug, and if they should, choose one of the other ones in class. The other change is change in strength or format. So you've heard me get a little excited about pharmacists getting to do their job. Um, so these are examples of drugs that we do, not every strength of the drug is available on, on the Pharmacare formulary. So you'll see here some very, probably the most um, common one here is the paroxetine, the antidepressant, and then maybe to the ramipril. Ramipril 500, or sorry, 15 milligrams they all taste. It's an ACE inhibitor and it's used for blood pressure, high blood pressure. So there's a 5 milligram strength and a 10 milligram strength, and they're available in the Pharmacare formulary. The 15 milligram strength isn't. The 15 milligram strength isn't a common strength that we see prescribed. So we would, we, if a client was prescribed 15 milligrams, we would want their, their prescription could be a, um, provided in a 5 and a 10 milligram strength, equaling the same dose. Similar with the Paxil or the Paroxetine, the antidepressant, Pharmacare covers a 20 milligram strength and a 30 milligram strength. They do not cover a 10 milligram strength. If someone was on a low dose um, Paroxetine or Paxil, they would be taking half the tablet. And this is a very common practice within pharmacy. Um, acyclovir, I'll jump down to the bottom one. This is one where it's a change of format. Okay, so uh, this is a very common cream used for, for cold sores. Um, it's available in a cream and it's available in an ointment. Um, just as a side, ointments are more greasy, they're more like Vaseline-like. Creams are, this one is a little bit, well, it's a cream and it's less greasy. <laughs> um, so more often than not, within our claims data, we see the ointment being prescribed. So a few people do get the, the cream. But usually they flip back and forth depending on what's available in the pharmacy. So pharmacists can change a cream for an ointment for this drug without contacting a physician. So it's a quick and easy change at the pharmacy counter after October 1st. So we have an example of, or another quest, frequently asked question about change in manufacture. And this is kind of around the brand of the drug. So BC Pharmacare lists certain brands, uh, certain manufacturers on the Pharmacare formulary. They base it on price and they base it on the ability of the manufacturers to meet the demands for BC residents. How much of that drug? Can you provide all the drug that all our BC residents are gonna need? So quite often this includes generic drugs um, and the generic drugs are less expensive than the name brand Innovator, the one that was first out on the market but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not listed on Pharmacare. It really depends on the price and the ability for the manufacturers to supply the drugs. So you know, as we all know, the generic drugs, um, they are required to be on the market. They have to have the same active ingredients, the same quality and performance as a brand name drug. We do know, however, that there are those cases where some people can't tolerate one manufacturer's version. They have a reaction to that one particular product. And that I think I'll, um, I do think I do mention it later and I'll come back to that, but we do have a mechanism in place if that does happen. It, we need um, clients and pharmacists to call FNHA, let us know so that we can work with Pharmacare to have a special authority put into place. We'll put something in place to make sure that people are getting the medications that they need. So just to get into this met metformin one a little bit more, I had my pharmacy team work on this over the summer and I said, find me an example so I can so I can talk on this. So metformin is a really good example. It's a very common medication used for diabetes. Um, and 
they ends up there's like 47 brands that have been on the Canadian market. That's a lot of different people making the same drug. Um, there's 15 brands of metformin that are covered in Pharmacare. Um, and that's going to be considered what they call the lowest cost alternative. It includes glycon, and it actually includes um, glucophage as well. So in this, the brand name is included in the coverage for Pharmacare for this drug. Um, the one brand, glucophage, this is one where it's covered up to the price. You can still choose that brand, uh, name brand, um, but there is a price difference in it. The other one, the brand name Glycon, that one is fully paid. So at the end of the day, I know I shared this example before, and I, and I'm, I may have misspoke, but I did cause a bit of confusion. So with this example, metformin is an open benefit. There's no issue or restriction to metformin. There's only 15 brands of the 47 that are available, have been available in Canada that are listed on the Pharmacare formulary. So it's a really good example of certain brands, certain manufacturers' brands, are covered within the Pharmacare program. NHB, because it's a national program, it, it makes sure it lists all the drugs manufacturers that are available in BC, in Quebec, in PEI, and in Saskatchewan. There's a lot, there's often more brand manufacturers listed um, in the NHB program for that reason. So uh, one of the frequently asked questions, like I mentioned, is um, if I had a reaction to generic drug and my doctor says no substitution, I need that brand name, what, what are we going to do now? So we, are, we have the ability to put special authorities in place to maintain coverage. Similar if there was an issue where there was an exceptional reason why a drug was covered, or if there was a, uh, an amount that was covered. Normally it wouldn't be covered, but there was a prior approval through the NHB system to exceed those limits. Um, when these cases happen, we are encouraging pharmacists and clients um, to call us so that we can work with Pharmacare to have something put into place. We were trying to have everything, all of these types of special authorities put into place before October 1, but they are hard to tease out in our data. So we don't, we're pretty, pretty certain that we haven't got everybody. So we'd really encourage you, if you or your family member or someone you know has gone through that NHB process to get coverage, let us know um, for these types of situations because we can help get something in place. After October 1st, still call us. We can still help get um, coverage put into place quite quickly for these items. Um, palliative care. Um, January 2017, ICIC. 2000, <laughs> a little bit uh, future thinking, Futurist. but uh, but anyway, palliative care, it changed January this year with anticipation of this whole transition happening. And that change, what it did is really stopped, Ing started to, I should say, started to include BC First Nations into the BC palliative care system through the drug benefits, no longer being excluded from those benefits and linkages into the health authority. Um, so again, if you have a family member or if you are aware of someone in the community, we really want to make sure prescribers are enrolling clients into the palliative care plan to ensure coverage going um, forward after October 1st. We have, um, my pharmacy team has been reaching out to pharmacies that have palliative patients um, identified within the NHB system and encouraging those pharmacists to enroll. And um, it sounds like everyone, it's starting to happen and these people are getting enrolled in the plan P. Um, so that's a great thing. So there's no disruption in service, uh, no disruption in coverage on October 1st. So compounds. These are those mixtures that your pharmacist makes up specially for you in the pharmacy. Um, the doctor writes a prescription and the pharmacist mix different commercially available products and, or powders and provides it. We know that there's been about 1,200 clients dispense compounds in 2017. So a lot of people get these, um, these, this benefit. BC Pharmacare policies and coverage apply after October 1st. So that means in some cases, some of these ingredients might need to be changed for coverage. Um, there's just some very unique requirements within the NHB um, program for compounds and these mixtures that, that are different in Pharmacare. So all everyone who's having a compound today, the pharmacist will be looking at those compounds, making sure that the formulation is right, the ingredients are right, for eligibility and coverage in Pharmacare. If there are items that we know we, we, that we can identify that require special authority, we put them into place and they'll be in place pr 
prior to October 1st. So I think that's pretty much the, the most frequently asked questions. There are lots of others. Um, I guess I'll turn it over to you, Davis. Great. Um, yes, so, so thank you um, for listening to our presentation. And, and I know we've uh, accumulated probably a few questions uh, throughout the, uh, the dialogue. So um, we've, we've got some folks here who are going to serve us up uh, some questions. And um, are, are we ready for this uh, portion? Great. My name's Catherine, and I'm part of the project team for the Pharma Care Transition. And um, I will ask the questions and direct it at each of our team members. The first one is for Davis. Um, just a question with regard to the session was just um, announced this week and there are thousands of people that are being impacted. Is this sufficient time with regard to communications? Sorry, the question is that the... The, the session, this webinar was only announced this week. Yeah. It was, is there enough time with regards to communicating out to all our community members? So, so we, we, that's, that's a great question and, and I'd like to thank the person who brought it forward. Um, I, I would say, our, as we kind of discussed earlier, our communication plan has really been in effect since June 30th. So, so I think this session has been one opportunity of, of many that, that folks have been participating on. Do we think we've reached each and every 143,000 citizens? We guess not. We're pretty sure we haven't. And, and with a large scale change like that, um, it, it can be very challenging. So, so I, th I would say, well, we're, we're doing our best. We do know that there will be people come October 1 that that aren't aware or haven't heard of this change so and and I think what what we're really looking for is having those folks call us uh, as we know and as has been communicated by Cindy and Darren 90% of people won't even notice so for myself uh, I, I take one prescription I'll go to the counter nothing will change it's all happening in the background we know that's true for 90% of our people it's it's those 10% that we're really focused on um, communicating to now so I would say through the specialty agencies, through the doctors, through the pharmacists, that's really where we're looking to engage people who may not have heard of this change. So um, I, I, I'm not sure if that answers the question. I, I, I hope it does. Um, and of course, uh, I think like we would committed to, we're always open to uh, further suggestions of how to reach uh, people that we haven't reached yet. Great. Cindy, the next question is to you as regards to the formulary. Are the eligible number of prescription drugs increasing or decreasing with the new formulary? Okay, so I don't have the numbers in, like, I, I haven't, we haven't tallied the numbers. We had a massive change of the drug formulary um, two weeks, a week ago, uh, moving over, moving over a lot of the over-the-counter items into the Pharmacare program. And in that, we do see some brand changes where again, where NHB will list many DINs or many items of the same product into the, um, into the system, whereas Pharmacare limits the number of duplications, I guess you could say, within those chemicals or drug groups. Um, so I don't have the numbers, but it is something that we can probably come up with and, and we should com communicate on. What do you think about the overall coverage, Cindy, is you know from a like-for-like -like scenario um, for well, for people who were on coverage uh, on therapies before September, like September thirtieth, um, before October first, there is going to be no difference for the drugs that they're on. For people starting new, it is. I don't. It, I mean, yeah, I'm only thinking of what we have in our claims versus what we can actually access. Mm -hmm. So it's a very hard number to pinpoint. Mm -hmm. We know there's a few drugs that are leaving, and we know there's a few drugs coming on. So the actual number I cannot actually um, provide right now. So Cindy, another question with regard to formulary. Is there a list of drugs that are available that will not be covered? Um, or that will no longer be covered? Those that will be changing? So we will be providing a list and I think we're just finalizing the list of drugs that we know that people are on today that um, will not be continued on um, after October 1st. The formularies list a lot of drugs that we don't actually, ha we haven't had um, people access in both programs. So we, we don't necessarily want to, I mean, we have to be careful how we move and answer that question because we don't want to say these drugs 
don't exist mm -hmm. because we need to look at the fulsome list. And when you look at the drugs that are listed on the formularies, there's like 30,000 DINs. And those 30,000 DINs, there's, you know, like I said, there's, there are slight differences among all of those drugs. Um, we will be listing the drugs that are no longer available for people who are on current therapies. We are also going to be posting the BC Pharmacare will be having the entire formulary that our clients can access on their website. So it's a searchable tool where you will be able to see the drugs that are listed there, the DINs that are listed there, and the other drugs within that same class or same chemical group. Um, and we will have a list of the drugs that are covered ongoing through the NHB system as well. So these lists are just getting finalized for, for uploading onto, onto our FNHA website. Thank you. Um, we have a question with regards to policy, so if either John or Darren can be prepared to answer this. Why is the changeover happening? Why are we transitioning to BC Pharmacare? Sure. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, it's, it's a really good question, and um, I think we, we, we covered it earlier in the, um, in the slide in, in that in these, in, as part of the seven directives that we received um, from the uh, First Nations leadership, in that they wanted to improve services from um, when, when if we were to make the initiative of creating the First Nations Health Authority, we had to really make the system better. And improving services, improving First Nations health benefits was really an important goal for, um, for the First Nations leadership. And um, uh, within, if we stayed within the non-insured health benefits program, and you heard from Cindy and Darren and Davis that um, if we stayed within NIHB, um, it's a national program, there was very little opportunity for us to uh, change the program because whatever changes that we, would, that we would make in British Columbia affected everybody across the country. And so they said, no, no, um, you had to keep the program. If you're going to stay in this program, you have to keep it exactly the same that, that it was. But we heard from BC First Nations, but wait, in British Columbia, we have some needs that are different than everybody else across the country. But because we're staying with a national program, they said um, there's no opportunity to change. And so for us to, so we, we worked on improving services, um, and then for us to actually change and modify the program to better suit the uh, needs of BC First Nations, we actually had to leave their system so that we can then, uh, uh, looking forward, and, and it's a, this is just one step of a longer journey, um, so that we can then work with our provincial partner to say now let's let's do the work to then modify and change it to uh, um, uh, to something that is going to meet the needs uh, down the road, and and that was the biggest change as to why we wanted to do this. Thank you. And no, I, I, I just to concur. I, you know, I always like to reflect back the words of, of one of our partners at Pharmacare who who likes to reference our. Uh, our ch our transition at October first as it, it's step one. It's not the end of the work. It, it's the beginning, and and now uh, we're part of that conversation with Pharmacare, as John has said, to be able to to uh, to change and adopt adapt the the benefit plan to better meet the needs of our our clients. I have another question here with regards to policy. With this transition, does this absolve the federal government responsibility for Aboriginal health? So speak a little bit with regards to our ongoing relationship with NIHB and Health Canada. Uh, sure. Um, the, the the quick answer is no. Um, I think in a lot of the the when when the uh, First Nations leadership uh, created the First Nations Health Authority, it was very made very very clear to uh, to everyone that this was an administrative relationship. And that because of this was an administrative relationship, we were taking the services and then just building on the services. But it didn't absolve anybody from the, the, the responsibilities um, moving forward. Um, uh, it just, it, what the relationship did and what this change does is it gives control to uh, BC First Nations to make decisions closer to home. But it doesn't change any, um, uh, any of the uh, responsibility of the, uh, of the federal government. I, I would just add that um, we, we have really clear instructions from when the leadership took their vote in 2011 and it's contained in directive number six, which is that any activities that we do um, cannot prejudice uh, First Nations and Aboriginal rights and titles. So uh, that, that instruction is very clearly uh, within all of our agreements. So. 
The next <coughs> question is um, with regards to status and the use of status cards. We had quite a few questions coming in, so what we did was we consolidate this into a cohesive question. Mm -hmm. So maybe perhaps Darren or someone else from the team can answer this. But if someone currently either doesn't have a status card or their status card has expired, um, but they do have the number, could we speak to with regards to their <coughs> access to BC Pharmacare, as we had stated that you require your BC Services card and your status card to access medications? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's actually one with uh, our, our summer of BC wildfires that has really been on the forefront for us. You know, uh, people people's ID could be uh, expired, uh, but it also may be destroyed. You know, and that that's certainly a problem that, that people could be having across across the province. Um, our messaging is that to ensure you get what you need, bring your status card and and bring your um, your BC Services card with your your PHN and. And, and that's to ensure that, that uh, people can obtain the full scope of benefits that are, are available to them. Uh, in order to obtain benefits through Plan W, uh, the real critical piece of ID is the BC Services Card. So it's, it's that Services Card which has your personal health number, uh, which is needed in order to access benefits through Plan W. Uh, the reason to ask uh, for people to bring their status card is in order to ensure that they, uh, if there's something that's along that sliver of the umbrella that Cindy talked about, uh, that, that is available through, through that part of the program, uh, you will need your status number. Now, do you need to arrive with your actual status card? That, that's the question. It, it, you know, if you've lost it or if it's expired, uh, I know certainly in terms of an expired card, uh, the number, or the card may expire, but, but the number does not. Uh, what we would suggest is that if you aren't sure on your status number and you need to uh, understand your coverage, pick up the phone, give us a call, and we'll try and work through how to ensure you have the information that you need to, to access your benefits. I'll, I'll add something uh, to that. The, uh, the arrangement um, in terms of First Nations Health Authority eligibility is determined by uh, two items. One is um, you know, do you have um, uh, are you do you have uh, status uh, through the Indian Registry uh, that's um, um, uh, that is determined by the Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada? And so that's number one. Uh, number two is the is do you live in the province of, of British Columbia, which is then determined by the Medical Services uh, Plan or MSP. And um, if you have those two pieces and you've registered with the First Nations Health Authority in the past, we already have you recognized and you don't have to do that again. Uh, it's only if you are new to the province and you're just moving in um, that we need that sort of on the, at, at the first time um, uh, coming in. But if you already have your status card and you already have your MSP prior to September 1st and you've already enrolled with us, we already have you in our, uh, in our, in our system. So can I just add one point to that? Like, so on October 1st, if you've been always going to the same pharmacy and they already have, and they know you, they have your status number, they have your care card number to be able to build the system anyway. The, the, the software changes or the computer system <laughs> changes have all been done. So there shouldn't be a need to have to present them for October 1st unless you're at a new pharmacy or if there's something different going on, okay? Um, but in general, October 1st, if you're, you're going to your local pharmacist and they know you, it'll be just filling prescriptions as normal. There's nothing new you need to show or reshow. Thank you. We have about six more minutes left, so I will go through the questions and select the ones that, are, that were asked with quite a lot of frequency mm -hmm. um, that came up in the chat box. So Cindy, this is a question for you. Um, now, if clients are asked to switch to a comparable drug, what happens if that drug doesn't work for them? Anytime a drug therapy doesn't work, um, we want to find a solution. And healthcare professionals will be able to provide yet another solution. And if it is a case where, for example, we talked about the no substitution where it was a, a brand that you can't tolerate, um, that, if that process or those approvals exist within the pharmacare system which is the need the prescribers to follow the BC Pharmacare system to have those authorities put into place for ongoing coverage or finding the drugs, um, working with the healthcare prescribers for an alternative that is covered. Like NHB, Pharmacare has an exceptional process. 
So because it's not listed, it doesn't mean you're completely excluded from ever getting that drug. They will look at cases on a case-by-case -case basis. They're these requests are initiated by the prescribers. Thank you. Cindy, a question that is similar and comparable is we talk about Plan W for Pharmacare and for the First Nations Health Authority. How does this integrate with the other plans within Pharmacare, such as Plan G for psychiatric medications, Plan P for palliative? Okay. So there are some core plans within Pharmacare, and by core plan it means that it covers most of the drugs that are available. <laughs> um, so Fair Pharmacare, you've heard us talk about earlier, which is the, the default plan for individuals who, um, non-status individual, non-FNHA clients in BC. Um, so these core plans have all the drugs on it. Um, plan W um, is one for um, the FNHA, for First Nations Health Authority clients, and they'll access drugs there. Plan G, which is the mental health plan, or cystic fibrosis plan, or the palliative care plan, the smoking cessation plan, the medication review plan, and any others that I might not be thinking off the top of my head. Um, clients can be enrolled in those plans as well. So there's nothing preventing or excluding First Nations from being enrolled in those plans and having the benefits in those plans if they're eligible. Um, again, too, if it is an individual who is um, accesses um, social assistance through the Ministry of Social Development, they can access the Pharmacare plan there as well. They would be they could be enrolled. Um, they'll still be eligible for the First Nations plan, so drug coverage will um, be available for those individuals. But again, you can be enrolled in more than one Pharmacare plan, mm -hmm. and there's no reason not to enroll, um, for prescribers not to enroll clients if they're eligible for those plans. Thank you. I think the next question is a combination of Darren and Cindy. Mm -hmm. We've told our clients, um, if you're traveling out of province, plan ahead. But what happens if you get sick while you're away or there's an accident? What happens to those people then? Yeah, I, I, I know that that, uh, that that absolutely can happen, right? So so we're uh, planning for that eventuality. We, we ask people to plan ahead and make sure you get what you need. And in many cases, uh, for, for most chronic medications, people will be able to access up to 100 days supply for, for what they're taking uh, before they leave uh, BC. Um, if you have an accident, uh, you'll likely enter the primary care system uh, outside of outside of the province, and you may be able to access some medications uh, through that system. Uh, the question will be when you show up at a pharmacy counter uh, outside of the province for an antibiotic or some other medication that may not be uh, expected uh, before you left on, on your travels. Um, there's, there's really sort of two solutions for that. One is that we do have a reimbursement process. Uh, so um, if you're able to purchase that medication, we really recommend you keep your receipt. Uh, there will be an online, um, uh, uh, online reimbursement form and a fairly simple process to submit your receipt and obtain reimbursement uh, through our program. Um, if uh, it's an emergent issue that you're not able to handle, uh, we would ask you to, to give us a call and we'll try and work with you through other solutions. Okay, good. Um, Cindy, another question with regard to the formulary and grandfathering. How will the grandfathering of medications be handled? What is the length of time that these drugs will be covered for? Okay, so we took a look at the, um, the grandfathering, the drugs that people are currently on, and we were looking at what drugs we want to continue on to make sure that there's no disruption or no, no need to have reassessment. And so these drugs are going to be grandfathered into the pharmacare system. Um, so whenever possible, we're putting those in, as indefinite. So again, it's done once and you don't have to do it again. Um, but when the drugs are subject uh, and are require more frequent monitoring, um, those special authorities or those that grandfathering um, those special authorities will need to be renewed and taken over by the physician just because they do require additional monitoring. Um, so the, the special authority renewals is pretty predictable. In the pharmacy, when the pharmacist 
bills through the prescription, they see the special authority expiry dates on their screen. So we've been communicating pharmacists is, you know what, if, if for our clients now, when you see those expiries coming up, let, let, our, let our clients know and they can make sure that next time they're in to see their doctor, they, they just remind the doctor. Or, I mean, quite often the doctors and their medical office assistants, they know when those are coming up to as well. And they'll do them automatically um, when they see clients in their, in their offices. Um, so, for the most part, whenever possible, we're doing it once and it'll be done. But there will be some drugs that do require renewals or the physician to reapply annually ongoing. Um, but those two, like I said, the pharmacist is the key person that will know when, it, when all of those expiry dates are. They have it right on their computer screen when they fill your prescription. Thank you. It's now 11.30. I'm going to sneak in one more question. Then I'm going to ask John to wrap up for us. Just to let you know that a lot of these questions are already answered on our webpage on the frequently asked questions. The other thing as well is that um, please feel free to call our toll-free line we have our assessors available to answer your questions. So what we want to do is to be ensure that everyone is comfortable and that we're supporting you through this transition. So Cindy, one more question quickly, is how can our clients find out more information on over-the-counter medication coverage? Okay. So this is going to be available on the Pharmacare website really soon. Um, and we are going to be looking at um, providing some information on how to navigate that website. Um, the over-the-counter items are pretty similar to what exists in NHB. What we did is we looked at what drugs people are accessing in NHB, what drugs are listed in NHB, and ha are having them available in Pharmacare. So there may be differences in the manufacturer that's available, um, but those same drugs or the same chemicals are available in the Pharmacare um, in the plan. Um, so Pharmacare will be listing the, the Plan W formulary on their website. I don't think it's active right now, but it's going to be active very soon. Um, but I would like to reassure everyone that the over-the-counter items are, when they're not available through the Pharmacare system, we have the NHB backup, the NHB, the few items in NHB that are going to be covered there. Um, so if it's not available Pharmacare, we'll expect that it would you would have coverage through the NHB program. Great. John, if you can um, wrap up the session for sure. us, thank you. Uh, I, I want to express again my gratitude and thank you everybody for um, uh, taking the time to listen to the information that we uh, have today. Um, th this truly is um, an extremely exciting time for for the First Nations Health Authority and uh, and BC First Nations, uh, you know, across the entire uh, province, um, we shared with you lots of information today, and 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 I think the the information that we've shared uh, really shows the extent that the team has has worked to um, uh, to think of every single scenario and and to to ensure that. Every single individual in the in the, that that is part of um, our program has a solution in place. Uh, come come October the uh, the first, um, there there was a lot of information, but there were some key messages that um, that Darren had shared and uh, and really wanting to, to to focus on 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 those things. If there's anything that um, uh, that we really want you to walk away from uh, is that you know clients uh, come October first in this transition. Um, will get the medications that they um, that they need, um, and even though that we've tried to think of every single scenario that um, that we've had, we also know that uh, we don't know what we don't know, and there may be possibilities where someone does run into an issue, and um, and if you have any issues, uh, please call the uh, health benefits uh, support line that uh, you see on the screen, or email us, and and we will make sure um, that uh, our team. Is ready is going to help and assist everybody that um, that needs help, and so the, you know uh, so we are here to help. Please call, please utilize us, and uh, really looking forward to um, to this bright future that we have um, moving moving forward after October first. Thanks. I'm back. <laughs> 
Thanks everyone, uh, the First Nations Health Authority for uh, presenting all of this really fantastic information. Uh, we really hope that this was helpful for all of you and uh, again please don't hesitate to uh, use the, the health benefits support line that they provided. They also have an email address uh, that's on the slide that's currently posted. Um, thanks so much to the UBC Learning Circle team for all the, the, the great work you're doing. Um, uh, we have Stefan Ladinovich who helped us with a technical issue earlier, so thanks for that. And uh, on that note, I wanted to close the session and, and again, a warm thanks to everyone. Uh, I also want to let you know that uh, you could tune in with us on uh, September 26th, next Tuesday at 10 a.m. for a uh, Fall Harvest Menu with uh, Jerry Kasten, uh, which will be um, a broadcast from the Foods and Nutrition Building in Vigit's Kitchen on campus. So we won't have this setting, but it'll be really fun and uh, we'll have some uh, tasty offerings for you. So thanks so much and uh, see you next week.